feel the power. Welcome to a Righteous Invasion of Truth with Dr. Abel Damina. Welcome to the ever-increasing world feast. I'm excited to welcome you, friends and family, right here on Facebook, YouTube, and all our social media handles. Abel Damina is my name. Listen, the truth of the word of God is, when God's word is preached and taught, God's power to save is made available. Brother Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. I'm honored to serve you grace today to bring you clarity of teaching from the word of God. Invite a friend, a loved one, create watch parties, tag people, because the word is going to come very hot and powerful today. You know, there's a mandate of God on my life to reintroduce Jesus to this generation, equipping the believer to know who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and what Christ can do through you. It is with that mandate in mind that this message is coming to you right now. It will change your life forever. However, remember the scripture tells us the time shall come when they shall not endure sound doctrine. The Greek word hugaino, wholesome doctrine. There's an endurance required. So as you listen, please painstakingly and patiently listen to the teaching of God's word. Don't listen with a critical mind. Listen with a mind to learn. You know, Jesus said, learn of me for I am meek and lowly of heart and you shall find rest. So there's a meekness required. Brother James says, with meekness, receive the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul. There's a meekness required, and there's endurance required where sound doctrine is concerned. So you want to patiently follow the teachings. Most of my teachings are in a series, so get ready to follow. And if there's anything you don't understand, be patient. The teachings will continue to explain themselves until you come to a place of understanding and clarity in the knowledge of Christ. One more thing to say with you today. If you're in an area where there's no Bible teaching church, where the message of Christ like this is preached, you can start one or you can join any of our campuses. Our campuses are extension houses of our local church where brethren come together and they are fed, they are taught, they take responsibility, they pray together, they reach out to the people in their community with the truth of God's word. Our campuses are lighthouses in nations and cities and communities where believers come together and they are taught the word of God by myself. And I'm excited if you want to be a part of what we're doing around your community or you want to start one. All you need to do is shoot me a mail today, Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. And we shall guide you on what to do to either begin one campus or join another. It's not good for you to be in isolation. The Bible says, do not dismiss the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. In prophecy, the word of God tells us that God will bring the solitary into families. You are a member of a family. And there is no family that does not have a gathering. Our gathering is our assemblage to be taught, to be equipped, and to become responsible for other people's growth. It's so important. And I'm looking forward to hearing from you today. Lastly, there's a plethora of books I have written that addresses so many issues of the Christian faith. They're all on the screen. Look at this. Today, you can order for a book or two or all the set by shooting an email to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com, including today's message. You can order for the CD or the DVD. The entire essence is to nourish you, enrich you, and equip you with robust understanding of your relationship with Almighty God. I'm excited to be able to serve you. Fasting your seatbelts. Let me take you right now into a gospel adventure, into the service where the spirit of our God is already moving. Happy viewing. Revelation chapter 1 verse 1, Brother John writes this later and he begins the later by saying, The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. He sent and signified this revelation by the angel to his servant John. Now, clearly, the subject matter of the book has been announced. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Just like it is with all the books in the epistles, they are all books written concerning the Christ. John 5.39, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. 
but they are they which testify of me. The entire books called the scriptures are the testimony of Jesus Christ. In Luke 24, 25, he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And I'm beginning from Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So the books of the Bible are targeted at unveiling one person. His name is Jesus. So the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And it's important to pay attention because that is what the hallmark of the entire Christianity is. To see Jesus. The revelation of Jesus offers to the believers so many things. First of all, it unveils your identity. Number two, it reveals to you your capacity. And number three, it shows you your ability and resources. Revelation means Christ is revealed. And that's what we get from the revelation of Jesus Christ. And to get the revelation of Jesus Christ, you read the book of Revelation. Amen. He says in Revelation chapter 1 verse 1, he said the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified by his angel unto his servant John. So Revelation chapter 1 verse 4. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now pay attention to the word first begotten. First begotten. Translated from the Greek word prototokos. Prototokos. P-R-O-T-O-T-O-K-O-S. Which implies a prototype. A model. Jesus is the model, the prototype. Now, the book of Revelation was not written to unveil the incarnate Christ. The book of Revelation was written to unveil the resurrected Christ. That's where the word first begotten. In the Gospels, Jesus is known as the only begotten. In the Epistles, Jesus is known as the first begotten, the prototokos or the prototype. All right? Now, in the Gospels, Jesus is the incarnate, the only begotten. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. John 1, 18. No man has seen God at any time, the only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the Father. All right? But now we see that Revelation is talking about the first begotten, meaning the book of Revelation is unveiling the resurrected Christ, not the incarnate Christ. The incarnate Christ is the monogenua, that's the Greek word, the only begotten son, meaning nobody else is like him. But the prototype, the first begotten from the dead, is the model or the sample of all those that will be born again from the dead. Everyone that is born of God is born from the dead. Because we were all dead in sins and trespasses, but he has quickened us. So, the same way Jesus rose from the dead as the prototype, all of us that are born again as a product of his resurrection, we are born from the dead. So, he is the prototype, the first begotten from the dead. From the dead. The sample or the model of all those that are born again. Romans 8.29 calls him the first begotten among many brethren. Colossians 1.18 calls him the firstborn from the dead. Firstborn from the dead. Hebrews 12.23 calls him the church of the firstborn. It calls us the church of the firstborn. He is the firstborn. We are the church of the firstborn. Now, it's important for you to know that in the resurrection, there is a consistency in the epistles that refers to Jesus as the first begotten. Meaning that firstly, the writer of the book of Revelation in chapter 1 verse 4 to 6 establishes a foundation of the believer's identification with Christ in his resurrection. The new birth. Revelation chapter 1 verse 4 to 6, first of all, is to teach the believer his identification with Christ in his resurrection. Look at it again. Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the prototokos, and the prince of the kings of the earth, 
unto him that loved us. Now take note of the tenses. Loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. His blood means his resurrection. The word, the prince of the kings of the earth was translated from the Greek word akon, A-R-C-H-O-N, which implies the beginning. Hence, he expressly stated, and had made us kings and priests unto God and his father, in verse 6. And has made us kings and priests unto God and his father. Now, that statement, unto him that loved us, past tense, was translated from the Greek word agape. A-G-A-P-E, agape or agapao, A-G-A-P-A-O, which implies to sacrifice. He explains to us how God did that sacrifice in his next statement. And washed us from all our sins in his own blood. That's the love of God, sacrifice. He washed us in his own blood. So his blood became the sacrifice for our washing. The word washed is also a past tense. Loved is a past tense. Washed is a past tense. Translated from the Greek word, I-O, I-O-U-O. It is a word that has a stronger meaning than cleaning something up. It actually means to break up from, to untie from. It is the same from the root word as I-O, which John used severally in his synoptic account. To break from, to untie from. To wash us from our sins means he broke us from our sins. He untied us from our sins. Meaning we and sin can never be tied together. We've been loosed. We've been detached. Whatever makes a man a sinner or subject to sin has been broken. The tie has been broken. We are free. Free from sin. Washed us. Loved us. Pay attention to those tenses. Loved us. Sacrificial. The death of Christ washed us. He broke the chain of sin over us. Untied us from sin. In John chapter 1 verse 27, you will see that word to lose. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me. Who shoes latch it? I'm not worthy to unloose. The same word, to unloose. All right? John 2, 19. Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. John 5, 18. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Broken, broken the Sabbath. John 7, 23. If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? So broken again, the same word for broken. I'm just showing where that word is used. The same word is used. John 10, 35. If he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. Broken. John eleven forty four. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Lose him and let him go. Lose him. Broken. Lose. So the word wash actually means God, through the blood of Jesus, has broken or severed permanently. Permanently. And irreversibly from sin. Washed us. So washing doesn't mean just to clean. There's a stronger word in the Greek. He has broken and severed us. He had loosed us. He has untied us permanently from sin. That's why he used the word washed. And if you watch carefully, John, before he got into the images that he saw in that revelation, in the book of Revelation chapter 1 to the end, the first thing he did was to establish the position of the believer as one who has been loved, as one who has been washed. All right? So he establishes that because that is important just as it is in all the epistles. In all the epistles, before anything, the first thing all the apostles did was to establish and reinforce the position of the believer in Christ as a product of the work of grace. That's why it is he that loved us. And because he loved us, he washed us. There's nothing with it. It's purely the work of grace. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son.
It is purely the work of grace. So brother John, in writing the book of Revelation, remember he wrote other books. He wrote 1st John, 2nd John, 3rd John, and he wrote the Gospel of John. He had already written four books before writing Revelation. Remember, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John are epistles, meaning they are doctrinal. Remember, the synoptic gospel is an account of the humanity of Christ. So, Brother John functioned both in the synoptics as an eyewitness and in the epistles as a doctrinal teacher before writing the book of Revelation. Now, in writing the book of Revelation, he now tells you, before he goes into, because, listen, the book of Revelation was a vision given to Brother John concerning the state of the seven churches who were already going into apostasy. Apostasy means they are staying away from the faith and they're developing itching ears and they're becoming victims of seducing spirits which came from doctrine of devils. So now he wrote based on that revelation. Secondly, when revelations are given to people, visions are given, the language of revelation is metaphorical, symbolic. It's not all literal, meaning any book that came as a result of revelation will require interpretation. In order for us to interpret revelation, we must have doctrinal overwhelming evidence. So that's why we're going to be traveling all through the Bible to establish what Brother John was saying in the book of Revelation. Beginning from the position of the believer as loved, washed, and made kings and priests. Already made. You already made a king. You are already a priest unto God. You will reign with him forever. Glory to God. So anything ahead is not going to affect your position. Anything now you will be saying, you must remember your position. So it's not like Brother John saw a revelation and in the revelation some people will not make it. No, you are already loved. You are already washed. You are already made. That's the foundation. I'm taking time to lay foundation because once the foundation is in place, it's easy to build. So John therefore was strengthening and assuring them of God's love. Demonstrated to us in the resurrection of his son, Jesus from the dead. So there is a consistency to explain the reality of who the believer is before giving instructions. The same way brother Paul will write. He will write to the church at Corinth. But you are washed. You are cleansed. You are called. You are accepted. Then he now goes further to say. But I hear that there is among you a brother who took his father's wife. So before instructing and rebuking and correcting. He reassures them of their position in Christ. Irrespective of their moral failure. Irrespective of their conduct problem. He first of all reassures them of who they are. Based on who they are is why he wants to rebuke. It is not the rebuke that will make you who you are. Eh, it is because of who you are that the rebuke is coming to put things right. So the book of Revelation is to seven churches. And in those seven churches there are believers who are washed, who are loved, who are made kings and priests unto our God. Remember again, the heart of the message is to reveal Christ. Why? Because those churches had started mixing and had started dabbling into apostasy and had started forgetting the revelation. So John had to bring back that revelation. Just as it is with many churches today, Christ is no more revealed. It's all about 10 steps to success. So a seed for the next level. You know. How to make it. Overtaking. Speed. Marriage or relationship panadol. Alright. So these churches had already started drifting and shifting. And so the revelation came to put them in place. Who hath made us? Made us. Who hath? Look at verse 5 and 6 again. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, 
and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his hath, father. Hath. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. All right. Now, the word hath made firstly implies John was writing to what God did in the past. He was writing to show them what God did in the past. Remember, it is to show them that God hath made us. He hath washed us. He hath loved us. What he did in the past. That is upon the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And which today is a present reality of who the believer is. Secondly, that word was translated from the Greek word poio. P-O-I-E-O. -E which implies to construct. Who hath made us. Hath made. To construct. To make. To manufacture. But tracing the fact that John in this text was explaining the new creation in Christ. Who hath made us, constructed us, manufactured us. Brother Paul would say it like this. We are his workmanship created, constructed, manufactured in Christ Jesus unto good works. Which God before ordained that we should walk in them. We are his handiwork we are the handwork of god that is kabatona god out of christ manufactured a man called a new creation he has already manufactured he has already made us he's not going to make us who hath made us somebody shout i am made in christ jesus say it again very loud I'm not going to be made. So when somebody says, God will make you, tell him, sorry, I've been made. That prayer is not for me. I've been made. Who has made us? Any prayer that always makes you lose sight of what Christ has done is to rob you of your reality. He has made us. And somebody says, but I am not yet made. Question, what do you understand by made? Well, so many of you, your idea of made is a Toyota Camry. Oh yes, he has made it. You are very carnal. You are far from Christ. A Toyota Camry is not a making. An arm robber can get a Toyota Camry, even five of it. Does it mean he is made? He's told to get that. For believers, material things don't define our reality. Our reality is Christ. When Christ rose from the dead and finished our case was settled. Somebody say, I'm made in Christ Jesus. That's right. Who hath made us, finished. Who hath constructed, manufactured us. We've been manufactured. His workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. The word made us kings was translated from the Greek word basileus. B-A-S-I-L-E-U-S. From another word, Basilea. B-A-S-I-L-E-I-A. -E -E that is, Basileus was taken from Basilea, which implies to reign. It was the same word Brother Paul used to the church in Rome when he wrote in Romans chapter 5, verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Once you receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, you reign. He hath made us kings and priests, and we shall reign. Revelation 1, 5 and 6. And from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his blood, verse 6, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. The word glory and dominion forever and ever. Now, the word forever and ever is translated from the Greek word aeon, aeon, A I O N, A I O N, which means age. Age. In other words, everything he explained that Christ has done for them and the reality of who they are in Christ 
can never change. Can never change. The work of Christ is complete and perfect. He hath loved us. He hath washed us. Complete work. Permanently done. And these facts of salvation are not conditional. They are not conditional. So the instructions that John is about to bring to the seven churches in Asia does not change what Christ has done in the believer. That is why John begins with establishing a doctrinal position for the believer in Christ, which has corroborative evidence in the other writings of the apostles. Enough overwhelming evidence. What Christ has done is complete, perfect in the believer. Somebody shout hallelujah. Say to me very loud, I am what the word says I am. Say it two more times. One more time. So upon the resurrection of Jesus, we are loved. We are washed from our sins. We are sons of God. And we are made unto the Father, kings and priests. This simply is the reality of who we are in Christ Jesus. Glory to God. That's who we are. Turn to your neighbor and say, I am washed. I am loved. I am made a king and a priest unto God the Father. And it will never change. It will never change. Amen. Eternally washed, eternally loved, eternally made a king and a priest. And what are we supposed to do? Reign. We reign forever. Now, so similar to all the apostolic writings doctrinally, Brother John emphasizes firstly what Christ has done for them and the reality of who they are in Christ. Then he now begins to give them instructions about their conduct. He begins to give them instructions about their conduct. Therefore, verse 4, 5, and 6 cannot be the visions and images. That is a doctrinal position of the church. Because John heard from angels and he saw images from angels. But certainly, not verse 4, 5, and 6. So whatever John wrote in John chapter 1, verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, must have come from the scriptures of the Old Testament. It must have come from doctrine. So John started before entering images and visions with the doctrinal position. Because there's no debating the fact that you are loved, you're washed, you're made a king and a priest unto God the Father. If that's your position, shout a powerful amen. amen. All right. Look 24, 25. And he looked at them and said, Oh fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. What have the prophets spoken? Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Verse 27, and beginning from Moses and all the prophets... Moses and all the prophets, the Old Testament scriptures, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Verse 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written where? In the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Not images and not visions. The scriptures. The scriptures. Doctrine. The scriptures. Now, again, Revelation chapter 1 verse 1 to 4. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to shew unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. He sent and signified by his angel unto his servant. If your Bible was mine, I will underline the word angelos. Angelos. And I'm sure you're wondering where is angelos in your Bible? Angel. I just gave you the Greek word for angel. Angelos. Angel. I will circle the word angel because that's going to come handy in the next few minutes. Romans 1, 1 to 4. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, 
called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. He has promised it where? By his prophets. Where? In the Holy Scriptures. What is contained in the Holy Scriptures? Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Yes. Which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. And declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So the scriptures contain the seed of David and declared to be the son of God. By the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. So clearly, Revelation chapter 1 verse 4 to 6 is the revelation of the scriptures. The establishing of the scriptural position. Inclusive of other chapters in the book. So now, Revelation 2 and 3, inclusive of other chapters in the book, are revelations. Revelations. Via the gifts in the spirit. Thus far, it suffices to say that the revelation of the scriptures were more than visions and dreams. Revelation chapter 1, verse 4 to 6 is the revelation of the scriptures. Why revelation chapter 2, chapter 3, inclusive of other chapters, are revelations via the gifts in the spirit. Thus far, it suffices to say that the revelation of the scriptures weighs more than visions and utterances. The reason why the scriptures weigh more than visions and utterances is the scriptures are that which are already written and you can make reference to them. Visions and dream can be seen by anybody. And it can be as wide as anything. And visions can travel beyond the scriptures. Visions. Mama had a vision some time back, many years ago. In the vision, she said Jesus walked into the room. She was just meditating. Suddenly she was caught up in a trance. And how did she know it was Jesus? Revelation. She read Revelation and she saw descriptions. His hair is split. His eyes are like fire. You know, his voice has the sound of many waters. And this guy walked to her looking very elegant and very handsome. And he said to her, as soon as she saw him, she knelt down. She knelt down in worship. She said the presence he came with was so strong. She just went in worship. Then he walked towards her. And he said to her, I am your savior. I will die for you. So on her knees, she now said, but the Bible says Jesus has already died for me. Suddenly, this beautiful, elegant, intimidating creature, all the shining stuff in his body started disappearing. Every shiny stuff started just by that pronouncement coming out of the written scripture. So the thing became a monster. Ugly. And then she said, he looked at her very furiously with anger. And he left the place. And she said, she suddenly realized herself. See, then the Lord said to her, you see, if you didn't know my word, that object will have messed up with you. That is why the scriptures are weightier than any vision. And I don't care who saw the vision and where the vision came from and where the revelation came from. Any vision and revelation that cannot be backed with the scripture, throw it in the dustbin. Irrespective of who saw it, how much less dream. You didn't hear me. How much less I dreamt. In the dream they were pursuing me. Who pursued you? They pursue you and you run and you woke up. Close your eyes, my friend. Lie down and pursue all of them. Pursue them deliberately, intentionally, and consciously. And until you see their terminal end, don't wake up. What are you talking about? I declare over you, the devil will never take advantage of you. 
Say, I grow in knowledge. I grow in grace. The scriptures, that is doctrine, is superior to visions, utterances, and revelation. Hear me and hear me well. When you have the world and you know the world, nobody can move you around. So the scriptures are weightier than visions and utterances. I am saying that because I'm going to go into something now. The scriptures are weightier than dreams, visions, and utterances. There is no verse of scripture that talks about dream interpretation. Not one. There's no verse that gives you a key to interpreting dreams. Not one. So where did they get enough to write a book? Till they had 50 something ways of interpreting dreams. It's fraud. It's fraud. It's just looking for how to make money through your ignorance. But they that know their God. There is no dream to interpret. The scriptures are already interpreted. They are interpreted in Christ. I'm complete in him. The head of all principalities and powers. Oh, somebody shout glory. glory. I said all that to say what I'm about to say. Therefore, in Bible teaching, as laid down in the epistles, and seen in Jesus' example, where we read in Luke 24, 25 to 27, 44 to 46, visions and revelations must, M-U-S-T, must be established on the revelation. Visions and revelations must be established on the revelation. What is the revelation? The written word. The written word. In essence, to properly understand Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, the letters to the churches given via visions, utterance, and interaction with angels. Because those books were written through visions, utterance and interaction with angels it is necessary to firstly understand the revelation what is the revelation the gospel of christ jesus that is the revelation the revelation the gospel of christ jesus which john explained in revelation 1 4 to 6 and in all his letters first john second john third john you must understand that first before delving into visions, revelations, and utterances. Please, this is fundamental. And you know, this is the reason why there's a lot of erroneous beliefs and practices by some believers. They read and study a chapter or two or three, among many others, without understanding Revelation chapter 1, verse 4 to 6. So because they don't understand Revelation 1 to 6, when they now see and say, he that overcometh, him will I grant you. But he that does not overcome, I will take away the candle. Then they conclude that a man can lose his salvation. The reason why they are concluding like that is because they have not understood chapter 1, verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, which lays the concrete foundation on which other things can be built. That's very, very instructive. So it begins with that doctrinal position. So in understanding the book of Revelation, therefore, we must look at the moment the visions, utterances, interaction with angels contradicts the word of God. We must look out for those places where the visions, the utterances, and the interaction with angels contradicted the written word. Once we find that, we take that and put where? Dustbin. We throw it away. We trash it. Alright? Now, and I'm going to give you the basis why we will do that. Brother Paul writes to the church in Galatia and that scripture speaks volumes. Galatians chapter 1 verse 6 to 8. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Yes. Which is not another, 
but there be some that trouble you and we pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, then that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Now he says, if angels, brother Paul now says, though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel than that we have laid in the apostolic framework, let him be accursed. So now, Brother Paul says that, bearing in mind that angels can interact with believers and give them another gospel. That's number one. Number two, Brother Paul said that because the apostles may give teachings that may contradict the framework already laid. So he now puts a warning. Though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel than what we have laid in this apostolic framework in the canon of scripture. He said, let that person be an anathema. The word a cause means anathema. What it means is cut the person off from you. Cut him off. Him and his messages, cut them off and stay away from them. Anathema, strong word. He said, even we, even I, Paul, if I come back to you and I preach anything that contradicts the canon, cut me off. Then he now said, if an angel just descend from heaven now and say to you anything that contradicts the canon, cut him off. Is that instructive? Okay, that's very instructive. Very, very instructive. Because that's a doctrinal position of scripture. That no angel has a right to appear in a vision and contradict the written word. No vision, no prophecy. So when somebody look at you in the name of prophecy and do you like this. I see your star. I see your star. You are going to be a great person. I see your star. But the village where you come, look for a good hand and land him a clean slap so he can see a better thing. The village where you come from. The kind of forces I am seeing. Your life will be with a battle. That prophecy is fraudulent. Fraudulent. Somebody say, why is it fraudulent? First of all, there is no human being that will not have battles in life. Whether you came from a village or a city. Battles in life are normal with humanity. Normal. That you are looking for husband and no husband is coming. It's not because you have a special problem. You are not the only one. There are many ladies that are looking for husband. And there are many men that are looking. I saw a man 56 years who said to me, I've been looking for a wife for 20 years. No one has agreed for me. So it's not just ladies. So when a man of God zero his prophecy around circumstances of life that are common to men, you know he's a chief prophet. He's looking for a way to your pocket. Somebody look at you and I see, I see, I see. I see. I kneel down, kneel down. He's trying to intimidate you. God has not given to us the spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and of a sound mind. Shine your eye, look at him, and say, what do you want to say? Say it. I'm not intimidated by your acrobatic. I'm born of God. I have the spirit of God. What are you talking about? Don't let anybody intimidate you. Any member of this church that gets intimidated needs a personal slap from me for wasting my hours of labor. I see. What are you seeing? Say it quickly. Let us put it on top of the written word. Let's carry what you are seeing and put it where? On top of the written word. If it does not align, what is the next thing? Does be. Brother Paul say, even if I, Paul, did you see that the weight of that statement? Even if I, Paul, come back and say anything to you that contradict what we have written, cut us off. He said, even an angel from heaven, not just a prophet, an angel that came from the throne of God, if he says anything to you that contradict the written word, let him be accursed. Somebody look at you and say, 
I see. Life will be very hard for you. Tell him, you times one million. That's why the Bible says, no temptation has taken you. But such as is common. So if you don't have a job, it's a common problem. Somebody look at you. 080 334. Tell him, empty and spirit. Come out of him. Before. If a man needs native doctor, they have to direct him to the village. Say, ah, when you travel for 30 minutes, make a turn. Enter the right. Then enter the left. Then move again for another 10 minutes. Then turn to the left. Then move again inside, inside. You will now see one red cloth tied on a tree. Behind that tree, you will now see the door. That's how to locate the native doctor before. But today, nobody goes there again. And now they are not coming with bush spirit. They are coming rebranded. Since churches have crowd and crowd like men of God that wear suit, they too, they wear suit. They wear perfume. They learn small English. Then they have discovered that people like Jesus, so they use Jesus' name. Then they have discovered that people like style, so the prophecy is no more crude. It is now stylish. They are so subtle. You must be grounded in knowledge to discern them. When knowledge increases, discernment becomes sharp. Sharp. You can pick them quickly. Why? Because you know. The greatest problem of a man is ignorance. Ignorance. The problem with some of us is we don't know who we are. Hey! And you will never know who you are till you know who he is. The revelation of Jesus unveils the believer. So visions, revelations, utterance must be subjected to the written word. Because the written word is weightier than visions, dreams, revelations, and even prophecies. All prophecies are subject to the written word. So that's why Jesus will say, you do err because you know not the scriptures, the written word, nor the power. So the power of God is not in a vision and a dream. The power of God is in the revelation of the written word. The power of God is in the revelation of the written word. So that's why brother Paul now says, though we are an angel from heaven, he gave a stern warning about the involvement of angels in the preaching of the gospel. He gave a stern warning. Notice Paul also included himself. Even if we are an angel, all right, in other words, it can be preached by legitimate ministers of the gospel. A wrong message can be preached by a legitimate minister. Okay? The word removed. You are so soon removed from him. Was translated from the Greek word metatemai. M-E-T-A-T-I-T-H-E-M-I. Which implies to change sides. You are removed. To change sides. To take away from a fixed position. Hence, Paul in the letter taught them to stand fast in the liberty that we have in Christ. Stand fast. Galatians 5.1 Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Hath, hath made us. Hath made us. Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us. We are made free. Now notice the tense used by Paul. Hath made us free. This means the tenses of the gospel of Christ. The tenses of the gospel of Christ. The grace of God in Christ is what God has done. The tenses of the gospel of Christ is what God has done. Not what God will do. What God has done done in the new testament is not about god doing something in the new testament 
is about what God has done, discovered by the man he has done it for. What God has done, discovered by the man he has done it for. That's the New Testament. It's not about God doing, God has finished everything. He has finished it. All the works are finished. That's why he used the word half. 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 Stand fast in the liberty. Where with Christ half. Half. However, another gospel tries to change it. Another gospel will change it subtly. Christ plus circumcision. Christ plus obedience to the law of Moses. Christ plus breaking generational causes. Christ plus service of firstborns. Have you heard of it? Service of what? So what makes firstborn different from secondborn? Why, why are you making it sound like there is a special service for firstborns? When in the sight of God, there is no first or secondborn, no Jew or Greek, no Gentile. All of us are one. So why are you having a different gospel for firstborns? That is another gospel. That's not the gospel of Christ. That's not the gospel of Christ. Christ plus makes it a perversion. Christ plus. Any gospel that adds anything to Christ is another one. Christ plus a drum of Goya oil. Christ plus Huh? Prayer show. Christ plus man to another gospel. Now, the word another gospel was translated from the Greek word heteros. Heteros, H-E-T-E-R-O-S, which implies different, altered, or strange. The word another, which is not another, in Galatians 1, 7 was translated from the Greek word alos, which implies another of the same sort. Another of the same sort. It sounds like the gospel. It sounds like it, but it is not. It sounds like the gospel, but it is not. Anointing service. That is another gospel. I know you like anointing service. Wednesday anointing service. It's another gospel. So that means as you are, you are not anointed. Till you attend the service. Where they will carry Goya oil with expiry and manufacturer date. And rub on your head. Then after that, you are anointed. What happens when the oil finish? Will the oil be on your head forever? Okay, so what happens when the oil finish? Then you go for another one. Anything that keeps you always hoping is not the gospel of Christ. What Christ has done is finished. It's finished. So anything that keeps making you look forward, forward, anointing service, anointing service, August anointing service, September is fraud. The believer in Christ doesn't need an anointing service. The anointing himself is inside him. Glory to God. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Do you have Christ? Do you have Christ? Who is Christ? The anointed one and his anointing. So if Christ is the anointed one and his anointing and the anointed one and his anointing is inside you, do you need an anointing service? Exactly. 
But preachers are easy to control you. They are easy to manipulate your ignorance. And to keep you coming. And always looking for what is not there. Bible says it perishes with the using. You know what that means? When they finish anointing you, if you clean it, that's the end. They give you papa for papa service. When you eat the papa and you go to the toilet, fear, it is out, it has finished. What Christ does is eternal. E de beleta. Another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that will trouble you, who will pervert the gospel of Christ. They are perverts. Glory! Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has set you free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage for whom the Son sets free is free. Stand up, let's close. Stand up, let's close. Glory! 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 But there be some that trouble you who will pervert the gospel of Christ. Any gospel that makes you not to be sure of Christ in your life is another gospel. Any gospel that makes you fear for Jesus' coming is another gospel. Anybody that is afraid of the coming of Christ is like a woman who has been abused by her husband. So that when she hears that the husband is coming, she's afraid. That many believers have been abused by religious teachers. That's why they are afraid of Jesus' coming. Otherwise, the coming of Christ is a husband coming back to his wife. And a wife should be excited that the husband is coming. But if that wife has been abused by religious teachers, Instead of being happy, the wife will become afraid. I'm excited. I'm excited. And I'm ready. I'm ready. He loved us. He washed us. And he has made us kings and priests unto our God. I thought the church would shout a dangerous amen. amen. Lift your right hand. I pray for you today. As your amen will come like thunder, you will never be deceived. By the revelation of God's word, you will walk in the light. You are the light. You are the light. You are the light. You are the light. Anywhere you enter, you will shine the light. Darkness will be exposed. The devil will be exposed. Forces of darkness will be exposed. In the name of Jesus. I decree and declare, based on what Christ has done in you and done for you and is doing through you today, grow in grace and in knowledge. In the name of Jesus, you are blessed beyond the cause. You are kept by the power of God. You are sustained by the finished work of Christ. It is well with you. It is well with your family. Every useless dream that has been scaring you expires right now. Every useless prophecy that has kept you in fear, the spell is broken. The spell is broken. Every wrong vision that has messed up your life, I command the oppression of the devil broken off your life. Enjoy the liberty in Christ. Enjoy the boldness in Christ. Enjoy the boldness in Christ. In the name of Jesus. The part of the righteous. He says the shining light. That shines brighter and brighter. Unto the perfect day. I declare and declare. As your amen will come like thunder. Every day of your life will be an increase on the previous. Your part is brighter and brighter. Your future is glorious and sweet. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for answered prayer. It is done in Jesus' name. And everybody says amen on a note of final letter. Say, I am washed. I am loved. I am made a king and a priest unto my God. I thought I would hear a beautiful amen. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. Oh, my goodness, what a service. I know you've been blessed by the word of his grace. Please don't go away. Don't go away. The essence of the teaching of God's word is to build you up, equip you, so you can do the work of ministry. That's the whole essence. Not just to acquire knowledge and see that, but to teach you so you can teach others. Brother Paul says, the things that you have learned of me among many witnesses, the same you commit to others, who shall also commit to others. Two things. Number one, 
If you don't belong to a Bible teaching church where the message of Christ is taught, where the revelation of Jesus is brought to you, then you either join one of our campuses or you can begin one in your community and become the lighthouse for other believers to assemble around and be fed and be taught the word. And today you want to join either a campus of ours or you want to start a campus. All you need to do is shoot me a mail, Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com with your details. We shall get in touch with you and we shall walk with you, equip you and train you. And we shall walk you through establishing a campus or being a part of one of our already existing campuses in your locality. Lastly, I've written a number of books to address doctrinal issues and to answer questions that you might have. They're on the screen right now. Today, if you require any of those books, you want to order for them or all of them, or you want to order for our CDs or DVDs, shoot a mail also to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com requesting for the materials and our office will get in touch with you and see how they can work out getting the books to wherever you are around the world. I'm excited that I'm able to be a blessing to you today. Remember, I'm live here on Facebook every morning at 10 a.m. GMT plus one, 12 noon GMT plus one, 6 p.m. GMT plus one, and 10 p.m. GMT plus one. Many times a day, feeding you, feeding you, feeding you, equipping you because we want you to come to a place of robust understanding of an effective relationship between you and God. Share with other people as you look forward to continuing to be a blessing in your life. And until I see you in the next broadcast, enjoy the rest of your day and be blessed. Amen. Amen.